in our Bible study this morning. This is a very tough subject matter. It's God's unchanging love, spousal rape in the scriptures. And what God is going to ask that you do is to look at each other, not as sin, but as people, as his children, as his beloved. I want you to know that the woman in the last video that we showed, who basically stated that men have more rights than women, is speaking from how the culture presents it, not how God presents it. For God did not create woman to be lesser than man, or man to be lesser than woman but in fact created her to be a helpmeet. And we will talk about that a little later on. But nowhere in the Bible, from my study, and I tell you I'm not the greatest scholar in the world, although I've had read the Bible several times, through and through, but never once have I ever seen God say, yea and amen, to the ideal of rape. Let's begin, ladies and gentlemen, with the whole idea of what the subject matter is. The Online Etymology Dictionary is one of the tools that we use along with the Blue Letter Bible, B-L-U-E-L-E-T-T-E-R-B-I-B-L-E dot -E -E org. And we'll be using that throughout the course of this particular Bible study lesson. What you'll see in bold is what the words meant at those particular time periods. The late 14th century, you look at the term, it meant to seize, to pray, to abduct, to take by force. I want you to understand before we even go on what God is saying about rape. Rape is literally taking something from someone that doesn't belong to you and leaving the person behind broken, shattered, maimed in spirit, broken in heart. God does not approve of that. To God that is sin, worthy of death. In fact, when you look at the Latin term, rapier, it means was used for sexually violated, literally to disgrace is what the terms mean in Latin. God is a God of grace, not disgrace. So nowhere in the Bible does God approve of the process of rape. What is rape? Rape is a crime of sexual intercourse. And I'm going to read this for you so that you'll have a knowledge and well-being of it. The crime of sexual intercourse with actual penetration of a woman's vagina with the man's penis without consent and accomplished through force, threat of violence, or intimidation such as a threat to harm a woman's child, husband, or boyfriend. What constitutes lack of consent usually includes saying no, or being too drunk or drug influence for the woman to be able to either resist or consent. But a recent Pennsylvania case ruled that a woman must do more than say no on this bizarre theory that no does not always mean don't but flirtatious come on and then there's date rape which involves rape by an acquaintance who refuses to stop when told to why is this important it's important for both the male and the female to know what the law is many a stupid mistake has led some to the grave and others to the jails. What else do you need to know? 
defense attorneys often argue that there had to be physical resistance. But I want you to understand the modern view. The modern view is that fear of harm in the relative strengths of the man and the woman are obvious deterrents to a woman fighting back. Any sexual intercourse with a child is rape, and in most states sexual relations even with consent involving girls 14 to 18 is statutory rape. But here's the thing that you need to know. The modern view regarding rape is simply the fear of harm. The fear of harm. That a woman feels that she would be violated. Now, I've heard many who have uttered the phraseology that the young woman did in the video earlier that said that men have control over a woman's body when they marry. But that goes against what the Word of God clearly states regarding rape. You see, in the Word of God, the two became one flesh. Not oppressing one and terrorizing the other. That's not biblical. Why is that important? Because the woman and the man need to know that they are equal in God's eyes. The woman and the man need to know that there is a respect of the body that comes with grace. You don't have power or control over a woman because she said I do. Because she said I do, she gave consent to marry you. That consent is not eternal. Meaning that every time I want to be with her, she's got to give it up. But can the Bible say, the Bible said, the Bible didn't say that. And we're going to talk about that, ladies and gentlemen. But also, men, you have to also consider how women have been taught about rape. It is no longer the sense of a physical attack. It's merely the fear. This is why it's not good to have sex outside of marriage. But sometimes it's not even good to have sex inside of marriage. Because you have to understand what a woman feels at all times. You have to be aware of her consent at all times. I know it's a very tough thing to have to teach you. It's a very tough thing to have to say. But things are a little different. They are different indeed. When it comes to the whole idea of scripture, rape was seen as a capital offense. Rape was seen as a capital offense, if you're taking notes. Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27 is the framework, the building block for understanding that. But if a man find a betrothed damsel. And a betrothed damsel is someone who's engaged to be married. In the field. And the man force her. And lie with her. Then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. She did not consent is what the Lord is saying here. Well, that's different that she's engaged, Ken. She ain't married. God is trying to express how important the whole idea of a sexual relationship is. 
in terms of verifying the role of God in a marriage. That consent is always pursued. Not that you would ever take something or prey upon a woman. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. Notice that the capital offense of rape is the equivalent to murder, manslaughter, homicide. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. You always talk about Boaz when you're preaching the gospel, the good news, and how Boaz redeemed the woman. You always speak of that particular thing. But do you not know as a husband, you're supposed to always be her kinsman redeemer. When she is dressed and ready for you, it does not mean that you shall have her always. Well, kid, how am I supposed to know what, what she's thinking? You ask and you shall receive. Even while we're doing it, ask, and you shall receive. You see, because today's rape is not built on merely the physical. Today's rape is built on the psychological. Her first no may not be her last yes. And her first yes may not be her last no. Well, Ken, she must have more power than I do. No. The power is placed upon you as a man. I don't understand that, Ken. How, how I got power? You got power because you have the ability to ask throughout. But the woman also has a responsibility to let you know if it is consensual or not. Here's the tough part. There are many women who have been in the church for many years who have told to, been told to suck it up. It's a part of being married. He want it, you give it to him. You know. He said, what you, what you gonna do? What you gonna do? Suck it up. You know. But sexual violence is not the prescription of God in any capacity whatsoever. Well, I'm not going to even want to have sex with her. Well, that might be a good thing. The whole idea is that you have to respect a woman, body, mind, soul, and spirit. And all four are with you at all times. It is a difficult thing to endure as well we've been taught. But just opposed to that, you will find that she will love you for being the Jesus in her eyes. No one wants to rape a woman. At least they should not if they love the Lord. I want to take you to the Levitical concubine in Judges 19 verse 25. But the men would not hearken to him. There was a man who was visiting someone, had his concubine with him, and they were demanding to be with the concubine and in hospitality the gentleman was telling them no don't 
do this. Don't do this. This is an abomination before the Lord and before the people of Israel. But the gentlemen pursued. And I do mean gentlemen, right? No, they're referred to as the men. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her. For those of you following along at home, knew her means that they sexually violated her. It, do, it wasn't a chat and chew. The men that had gathered sexually violated her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, <coughs> they let her go. The unfortunate tale of that, as you go on to read, is that the woman died at the front door. She had been raped to death. And her lover cut her up into pieces and sent her body throughout all of Israel, asking, what shall Israel do about this? God condemned rape. God does not want us to rape anyone, male or female. But women also, you have to understand the role that you have. No, I'm not blaming you for a man raping you. Please put your anger down for a moment. But as a married woman, you need to have the power within to say, this is not what I want. This is not what we will do. I will not do this. And for many of you all, you think the Bible doesn't back you up in that, and the Bible actually does. The Bible says that you should give each other some space if you cannot agree. But Paul writes that you shouldn't take too long with that. God doesn't want you to be abused in any capacity whatsoever because abuse is not love. Let me take you to scripture and man and wife, what a man and wife role is. Genesis 2, verses 22 to 25. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. <clears throat> and Adam said, <clears throat> This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked. The man and his wife were not ashamed. There's no disgrace in the marriage between the two, Adam and Eve. There's no reason to be ashamed. And the reason that you need to know that is because God created for him a helpmate, Isaiah, which basically means one who helps. You see, you have to understand that Adam was having a difficult time with the whole idea of being the only person. All the other animals around him, all the nature, all the life, he's the first scientist. And there's no one like him on the earth. And God said, let us make them 
in our image. Why is that important? Because if God made you, man, in his image, God also made woman in his image. The respect and the love of the woman should be the same respect and love that Jesus had for the church. Even the church can say no. But Ken, and the woman supposed to obey you like the, like the church supposed to obey Jesus? Well, be Jesus enough and she will obey you. Now, I know that might not necessarily be the most acceptable way of saying it. But when you make that statement about obedience, we don't obey God because he could kill us. We obey God because he gave us eternal life. Your exampling of Jesus should be one of seeing the church as a helpmate, seeing your wife as a helpmate. And woman, you ought to see yourself as his helpmate. He can be no good to you if he doesn't know what you're thinking. Well, he should just know me by now. There was a song that said, if you don't know me by now, you'll never, never know me. Well, most men will never, never know you because they don't know you from the beginning or to the end. They don't know you. I don't know what you're thinking. I'm not a mind reader, and I haven't found one yet. So there's a responsibility on both parts. A man should never use his physical force to prey upon the one he's considered his helpmeet. And a woman should never enter into a bedroom pretending to consent to a sexual relationship. Or if in the middle you feel that there is something wrong or that there is an abuse, at that point it's no, stop, I get up, I'm not in this. And if it persists, then you must hold him accountable to the law. Wow, these are tough things, Ken, you're saying. But why? Because she is your helpmeet. Would you hurt yourself the way that you're hurting her? Are you naked and unashamed? Or are you naked and ashamed? Where is that grace that we speak of? Let me take you to 1 Corinthians 7, 3-4. This is a misused scripture. Can y'all write that one down as a note? Because I'm so tired of y'all, and some of you sisters are the main ones when you should be upholding the woman, that you, you misuse this, you just take it completely out of the context, <coughs> and you make tyranny easy. You become as much an oppressor as the man that she just left. 1 Corinthians 7, 3-5 says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise unto the wife unto, likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife have not power over her own body, but the husband. See, you all get that part. That part stuck in the head. Oh, girl. Mm-hmm. Shoot, he brought home a paycheck. Mm. You should give him what he want. Shoot. Mm. Sometimes he likes it tough. You know, you got to be tough too. You know, if he likes it tough, you be tough with him. If he slap you, you slap him back. 
Stop bringing the foolishness to the covenant relationship. Here's the part you miss. And likewise, also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Wait a minute, didn't we see that before? Yeah. Remember in Genesis where the two became one flesh? Do you understand? It's consensual at all times. God did not make you unequal. God created you in his image, which makes you equal to one another. This is why it is written, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. Consent, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Whether you're unmarried, which you shouldn't be doing, but if you're unmarried and you're doing it, it's by consent. If you're married and you're doing it, it's by consent. Consent before, consent during, consent after. Ken, that, you might as well have an attorney in the bedroom with you then. You got to go through all that. Well, if you feel that way, you should just go ahead. It's far better to have an attorney at the door of the bedroom than to have him in the courtroom. Read the scriptures that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. He says, go back to God. When there's a brokenness of spirit, go back to God. And come together again. Why? Who is after your marriage? It's not Shaniqua. It's not little Joe. Satan is after your marriage. Tempt you not for your incon incontinency. Do you understand what God is saying clearly here? Let me take you to Colossians 3.19 what the Bible says and God expects. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Don't be angry. If she say no, that's all right. I love you, baby. I'm just going to go into the living room and watch some TV. No, nah, man, I, I work hard. She's supposed to do stuff for me. Where is that in the Bible? And ladies, your children should not be the pawn of your relationship with him, nor should your sex be. Mm. I ain't going to give it to him until he give me something. I ain't going to do nothing. Mm, I'm going to show him. I'll show him who run this shit. Mm -mm. That's not right. Ephesians 5.32 This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ in the church. Christ never raped the church. He's married to the church. He never raped the church. He gave up his very life for the church. That's the example that you follow. Not the boys at the bar who giving you all that advice or at the barbershop who say, you know, man, shoot, hard you working, man. You bringing home all that pay and she don't feel like it? Shoot, you better get yours. All that foolishness has got to go. You have got to love her so much you'd be willing to die for her. And women, you must be willing to love him so much that you'll be willing to die for him. But not in an abusive relationship. When you look at the term love, agapeo, is referring to a person's in welcome 
to entertain, to be fond of, to love dearly. I only want to stick with the person part right here. That you got the thing part. But I want to stick with the person part about love. You should be always welcoming to each other. It does not mean that you're always going to have sex with one another. But you should be welcoming to one another. Hospitality was very huge in Christendom and in Judaic culture. The woman Remember the 1950s, they would show the woman running down the stairs of the house to greet her husband at the door? Nobody's asking you to do that now, although, it, pff, what the heck, it might be a great thing to do in your relationship, make a great marriage. He opens the door, there you are, giving him a big old hug, especially in the outfit he wants to see you in, but forgive me. But what would it cost you? to greet your husband and ask him how was your day? What would it hurt you, sir, to greet your wife and ask her how was your day? Welcome. Here's the other part of your relationship. To entertain one another. A funky attitude might be a sign of depression might be a sign that you bumped the car or might be somebody got on your nerves at the office but you don't take it out on the person at home you are to entertain one another be lively with one another don't be fake and false if you had a bad day let the person know that you had a bad day they might be willing to rub your feet and give you a steak dinner with potatoes you never know How about to be fond of? You must think of them fondly. You must think of them in such a way, it's as if you were holding a water lily in your hand with the water and you don't want the lilies flowering to be diminished or fractured in any capacity or any way. You're just holding it gently. Peter writes that women are the weaker sex and that you are to love her gently. They didn't mean weaker in the sense that, you know, she's so frail she's going to be broken. No, she, that's not what Peter was writing. Peter was writing about the simple fact that she is the church. She's fragile. She may have had a tough day. It takes 24 hours to get a woman in the mood in the first place. Some of y'all haven't studied that yet, but it, it takes a while. For us, it only takes about three minutes. You know, we're already there. But for her, it takes a while. And if she's had some things going on, sometimes she just wants you to listen to her. She doesn't want you to make a move on her. She just wants you to listen. But in no way do you have a right to take from her, to seize from her, to prey upon her in her weakness? You have to love her as Christ loved the church. And here's the last one, to love dearly. I'm going to tell you that there are times when we don't love one another. And instead of faking the funk, because I see you when you're in the church parking lot. I know some of y'all want to get back to doing that. Church parking lot, you're cussing each other out in the car, and then you get out of the car, and you hug each other as you're going up to say, Good morning, brother. Good morning, sister. Oh, and praise the Lord. And you praise the Lord, and you're jumping up and down, and you're celebrating, and you're running through, and you're doing all the churchified things, and you get back out in the car, and you Cussing each other again. Cussing, cussing, just ah, nothing's changed. To love one dearly. There was a college professor, actually the president of a college once, who had just been promoted. 
He was about to receive all of the accolades that he had been working his entire life for. And his wife came down with Alzheimer's. And he had to make a decision. Do I keep the job that would make me travel a lot and give speeches around the world and people will know how brilliant and how great I am? Or do I stay home with her and care for her all the last days of her life? That college professor stayed home. And I'm quite certain there were many people around him, especially church folk. Oh, I wouldn't have done that. Mm -mm, I could have got a nurse. But fondly and dearly he loved her until she died. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that eight pack will eventually become a barrel. That brick house will eventually become a mansion. We're going to change in our body. We're going to change in our weight. We're going to change how we look. We're going to change, change, change. But the one thing that shouldn't change is the love that God has and your love towards God and your neighbor and your wife. Are there going to be always great days? No. Women, you cannot sway him by threatening him with the allegation of sexual assault or sexual violence or rape. And men, even if she says you did it and you know that you didn't do it in your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, it's not a matter in the modern world of that the fact that you did it physically is that she, she was thinking that you did. Love one another as Christ loved the church. Women, be open and honest with your man. If you do not wish to have sex with him, do not consent. And if you feel that you're not in a right relationship while you're doing it, be honest with him then and say, I need to get up. And when you're through and there was consent throughout, don't lie. Don't make a false allegation. Men, never rape a woman. For the punishment in the eyes of God is not seven to eight years in prison. He believes you should die. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much. I hope that this was helpful to you. I want to leave you with that particular image often found in marriages in which there is rape. Men are blind to it. And women won't say anything. Who are they to say it to? If in the course of your marriage or at any time you have been raped or abused or there was incest in your relationship, I want you to get in contact with RAIN. It's a national network they are available 24 hours a day. They have a private chat option. Or you can call by phone. 1-800-656-4673. God wants you to be at peace, not at war with one another. Never rape. Never abuse, never commit incest. Because in the eyes of God, it is akin to murder. Thank you all so much for being here for this week's Bible study. I hope that you got a lot from it. And I will encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, if you know of anyone who has been abused, point them in the right direction. First with prayer and then to get in contact with someone that can support and help them. It does not mean it's always going to come from your church. Sometimes the best help comes outside of it. But 
allow God to lead and guide you to where you need the help most and who can give it. God bless you. And if you don't remember anything else I said today, remember this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. Thank <music> you.